He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen and praise God. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Resurrection Sunday. My name is Pastor Mark, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at Colonial. We're so grateful to have you here today. I do have a couple announcements for you. And one of our core values is to love generously. And to that end, every year on Easter, we do what's called a Bless Our City offering. And so all the money that's contributed today uh, does not go for internal purposes, but to bless those outside of the four walls of our church through our missions partnerships, including those who are ministering to the homeless, those who are ministering to those who have been trafficked, those who are in addiction recovery programs, and the list goes on. And so we hope that you'll take advantage of that by writing a check that you can leave in the black boxes as you exit the sanctuary, heading out into our lobby. They're on the wall there. Or you can go on our website, colonialkc.org, and contribute there as well. In addition, if you are, have questions about Christianity or have doubts or are skeptical of anything related to the faith, we want to invite you to join us for a group that's coming up. So I want you to take a look at this video for more information. In times of uncertainty, many people start to question things about life and God. Maybe you're evaluating what in life really matters to you or if God is even real. Maybe you wrestle with questions like, is God really relevant to my life? Is the Bible true and reliable? Is God a loving God and does he care? Is Jesus the only way to God? Is there really life after death? If you're ready to explore things of faith, join us for a four-week investigative forum called IF. Each week we'll examine a different claim of Christianity and you will be given the opportunity to ask questions and shape the discussion. If you could ask God one question, what would you ask Him? Hey, you may know Pastor Bob Leyliner. He's been here 51 years, believe it or not. And uh, Bob is retiring. And he doesn't need our vote whether or not he's retiring. But we are going to have a congregational meeting next Sunday right after service for five to ten minutes because we would love to vote on the fact that he is going to become Pastor Emeritus at our church. So we're not letting him go that easy. Uh, We want to, hopefully you can come and just stick around for a few minutes after service if you're a member of our church next Sunday. Hey, if you are new to us and you want to get connected, the best way to do that is to find the Connect card, which is in the seat back in front of you. Fill that out and drop it by the welcome desk on your way out today or in those black boxes. We'd love a chance to get to know you better. Also, there's a prayer card there, and our church values praying first and praying for our members and attenders. And so if you have a prayer request, anything that you need prayer for, please fill that out and, again, uh, give it to us. Hand it in those black boxes after the service. We would love a chance to be praying for you. With no further ado, let's stand and greet those around us in the name of Christ. church. He is risen. We want to welcome you on this Easter Sunday to join us in celebration of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please enjoy the choir, enjoy the orchestra, and join us in singing, Christ the Lord is risen today.
church, let's read together from 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Christ is risen. John, let's read together responsively. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you this day for the new birth and the living hope you've given to us through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we rejoice that through faith in him, we have fellowship with you, the God of all creation. But Lord, we're reminded that you are light and in you is no darkness at all. 
And when we walk in darkness, we lose that fellowship with you and fall into sin. Father, forgive us for choosing dark paths when we could walk in the light with you. Holy Spirit, convict us now. Don't let us be deceived. Let your truth rise up within us and show us where we've gone astray. And then, Lord, in your mercy, hear each of us as we confess these things to you. And according to your word, please forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, thank you for hearing us, and thank you for the assurance of forgiveness you've given to us in Paul's letter to the Colossians. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. God, we praise you for the love and mercy you've shown to us in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, as you sacrificed yourself for us, teach us to do the same as we offer our worship to you this morning. Remind us that we are to be living sacrifices, trusting you and giving glory to you in all things, walking not only in the joy of the empty tomb, but also in the humility of the cross. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. No work is finished. The My living Lord, who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my Yeah. 
Death has lost its sting on me. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's just take a moment right now and to reflect and catch our breath. <laughs> Thanking Jesus for what he has done by overcoming the grave. God, we give thanks that you are our living hope. And so as the prayer team comes down forward and the prayer team's stationed in the back, I want to invite you to be prayed over if that's something that you came in with needing. I don't know about you, but I know for me, there's a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of uh, things going on before the church service. There's a lot of things that need prayer for, and so part of this is inviting our prayer team to intercede on your behalf here today. Whether it's for you or for your loved one, something that you're struggling with or something that someone else is struggling with that's close to you. Or if you just want to come up and share a, a praise request, you're more than welcome to do that as well. We'd love nothing more than to be praying for you here this morning. As we enter into this time of prayer, Jesus, I'm reminded that you had no servants, and yet they called you master. <laughs> you had no formal degree, and yet they called you teacher. No military army, and yet you are our king. You had no medicine, but God, you are the healer. 
You won no military battles, Lord, but yet you conquered the world. Jesus, you committed no crimes. And yet you willingly were crucified on our behalf. Even though you were buried. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you rose from the dead. That you overcame sin and death. So that we could have life both abundant and eternal. Thank you, Lord. God, as we think about our missionaries all throughout the city, we pray that our Bless the City offering would be used a hundredfold to continue to bless those who they minister to on a daily basis. One of those being the Healing House Ministries and their executive director, Bobby Joe Reed. And so, Lord, this morning as our missionary of the week, we pray for Bobby Joe and for her ministry to those who are dealing with substance abuse recovery. God, we pray that you would break those addictions uh, supernaturally and that they would give you all the glory and all the credit and all the praise for freeing them from whatever it is that they are undergoing during this difficult time in their lives. Lord, we pray for holistic restoration and for you to meet the physical and spiritual needs of each person that walks through those doors as they continue to, to counsel and guide and share the gospel with those who are trying to overcome their, their addiction. God, we also know that wherever there is hope and healing, wherever there is people that proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there will be attacks by the enemy. And so, Lord, we pray against those attacks. And for Bobby Joe and her staff to be raised up and to identify uh, the lies of the enemy and to reject those lies and to replace them with the scripture. God, we pray that you would grant them wisdom, discernment, and rest, and that you would continue to expand, expand their sphere of influence all throughout the city, Lord. And Lord, we also want to pray today for our prayer persons this week, for Holly Bellify here at the South Kansas City campus and for her family and for the family of Donna Jenkins at our Overland Park campus today. God, you are the provider and you know exactly what they need. So God, I pray that you would meet their needs during this time. Help them to have great time with family here later on today if that's what their plans are. Uh, draw near to them. Keep them safe and healthy. And allow them to continue to, to minister to not only their kids, but their grandkids and their families as well as their friends and neighbors. God, we also want to give thanks today for our military persons of the week and for especially for U.S. Army Ranger Second Lieutenant Luke, who is stationed in Savannah, Georgia, the great nephew of Gail Fredling. God, we give thanks that uh, there are people that you have raised up and called for this specific purpose to serve in our military. And God, I pray that you would uh, use them to be the light of Christ in this hurting culture so the lost are found and the broken are made whole. God, we also pray today for our campus pastor, for Pastor Greg and his family today. And we pray especially as Pastor Greg shares the message of hope that you have given him to share, that he, it would impact each of our hearts for eternity, that you would speak to him and through him for your glory. And God, we pray all these things and we ask all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. He is risen. Amen. Let us stand and read the word of God together. Reading from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. And it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back home. You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So when I was 15 years old, I came home and my father told me one of my best friends, Erica, had passed away. I was heartbroken. I cried, I almost fainted. This girl, I've been knowing her for years. When, when my family first moved to this neighborhood, she made me feel welcome in this strange place. I couldn't wrap my mind around her being gone, so I ran around the corner to her house. I rang the doorbell, and Erica answered the door. I gasped for air. I almost fainted again. I reached to touch her, her gra grab her arm and her hand to see if she was real. She wasn't dead. She was alive. My father had gotten the person mixed up. It wasn't Erica, it was somebody else. I grabbed her, I hugged her because I thought all was lost. I thought she was gone. I thought there would be an empty space where my best friend lived. But that was not the case because she was alive. I could only imagine the first thing I thought, what the disciples felt when they got the news that Jesus was alive. When the group who ran to the tomb and saw the tomb was empty, I can only imagine they were expecting to see a person lying dead after an excruciating death. But when they got to the tomb, it was clear that the tomb was empty. They thought all was lost. The hole in their heart was forever empty, but to their surprise, he was not there, he's alive. We've been walking through the book of John and, and chronicling the life of Jesus as he journeyed to the cross. And today, this Easter Sunday, we find ourselves at the moment of truth. Jesus has struggled to carry his cross to Golgotha. He is nailed to a cross and thorns have been placed on his head. 
He's bleeding. He's been punctured in the side. He has forgiven those who are ridiculing them by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He has granted life eternal to the thief that was hung alongside him, telling him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He has established care for his mother by telling the disciple he loved to behold his mother and to his mother to behold her son. He has had his one-on-one conversation with Abba, the father. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He has fulfilled prophecy and declared that he is thirsty. He has solidified and stamped the accomplished work of the cross when he says to Telestai, it is finished. And he closes his discourse from the cross by walking into the hands, the only hands who can provide him rest, saying, into thy hands, the Father's hands, I commit my spirit. He's buried in a tomb. My grandfather said they, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. <laughs> Joseph of Arimathea, likely a person of stature who would not publicly express his belief, but wanted to show his loyalty by providing this tomb for Jesus to be buried in. Jesus is buried. Friday has come to a close. Saturday has made its way with no signs of success. Then Sunday morning, as Pastor Mark preached a couple of weeks ago, on Friday there was concern, but Sunday is a coming. <laughs> and here we are. Sunday is here. The few followers that did not run away are waiting, depressed, broken, confused. And here comes the word they all were waiting for, but consciously doubted they would ever see it and hear it. The tomb is empty. He's not there. His absence from the tomb proved to be real. His absence from the tomb shows the evidence of a faith we can believe in. Why is that important? Because there are a lot of counterfeit religions out there. They, can't, they claim to be the truth, but they fall short. They're trying to fill a void. They're trying to be the answer but with a little testing, they proved to be fakes. Have you ever heard the term the real McCoy? The real McCoy was the inventor, Elijah McCoy, an African-American born in Canada in 1844. He had many different inventions, including an iron board and a long sprinkler. Other companies copied his devices, but they never worked as well as Elijah's. So people would come into a place and they would say, I want whatever it is and make sure it's the real McCoy. When the disciples found the tomb empty, Jesus proved that the faith he was presenting was the real McCoy. There are many options these days. There, there, there are many religions to choose from. For instance, Hinduism. Most Hindus believe in a supreme God, that there are a multitude of gods that come from him, believe that the soul passes through a cycle of successive lives, and its next incarnation is always dependent on how the previous life was lived. Buddhism arose from one man's quest for enlightenment, whom they call Buddha. The path to enlightenment is through the practice of development of morality, meditation, and wisdom. Islam, followers of Islam are called Muslims. Muslims base their laws on their holy book, the Quran and the Sunnah. According to Muslims, God sent a number of prophets to, man, to mankind to teach them how to live. According to his law, Jesus, Moses, and Abraham are respected prophets of God, but they believe the final prophet was Muhammad. Mormonism, the church is called the Church of Latter-day Saints. Mormons believe their church is a restoration of the church as conceived by Jesus and that the other Christian churches have gone astray. It was founded by Joseph Smith, and they believe God has a physical body. He's married and can have children. 
They also believe that humans can become gods in the afterlife. <laughs> None of them have the evidence of an empty tomb. None of them can base their claim in solid proof with witnesses and testimony. Only Christianity, the followers of Christ, can make that claim. It is significant that John, along with the rest of the gospel writers, designated the day of the resurrection as the first day of the week, rather than the third day after the resurrection. See, although the death of Jesus was absolutely crucial for salvation and the forgiveness of sins, we have to admit this changed everything. Now, the hinge point of Christianity is the resurrection. These religions provide something to believe in, but only one belief system has a foundation that is proven and established by the evidence of witnesses and an empty tomb. Only one stands for eternity. Only one belief passes the truth test. Only one faith is able to provide life through faith alone that is not dependent on your work. A faith that is not dependent on your status. A faith that is grounded in the work of one person whose name is Jesus Christ. Only one proves to be the real thing. So in our text today, Sunday has come. And to the surprise of those who are still very close to Jesus, even though he told them what would happen, they witnessed a miracle. If I was to wrap this whole sermon up in one sentence, I would say, don't discredit the impossible, because with God, all things are possible. Don't discredit the impossible. Because with God, all things are possible. I got three points I want to present to you today. Are you interested? Yes. Hey Amen. It's Easter morning. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> First, we learn this. Hearing is not necessarily believing. Right. Hearing is not necessarily believing. We read in uh, verses 1 and 2 of John 20. Now, on the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. See, we see it is, it is Mary who first comes to the tomb. Uh, this was the Mary that is recorded as having seven demons removed by Jesus. And Jesus had done for her what no one else could do. He had forgiven and cleansed her. So she comes in the darkness sometime around 3 a.m. only to discover that something has happened. The stone has been removed. When Mary got to the grave, she knew with dismay someone had been there. Jesus, he's been preaching and teaching that this was to come, but the disciples were so focused and set on overthrowing the Roman Empire that they did not perceive or really care to hear Jesus' way to victory would be nailed on the cross. The appearance and the emotion were to walk and believe Jesus, but what we see is they missed it. Joseph Parker in his commentary on the book of John, he says this, Mary rushed in to the details of a controversy instead of standing a little way from it and catching its outlines and its general hearings. There is very much practical atheism in this devoted woman's talk. Though she is speaking to angels, she left God out of her sobbing and tearful speech. And consequently, the words which ought to have glowed with the sublime faith are only feverish with personal disappointment and more or less of peevish complaint. She speaks as if the whole question lay between certain other people and herself. Thus, they have taken, and I know not. She is lost where millions of other people have been lost. That is to say, in the murky 
and noisy region of second causes, she was calculating time by her own ill-gotten clock and not taking the hour from the unchanging and truth-telling sun. Just what we are all doing, and the doing of which we bring ourselves to disappointment and tears. She, like us, hear the word. We read the word. But does our life actually exemplify a life that believes the word? Are we looking to the Bible for answers or waiting to see what the morning news has to say? Are we looking to God for direction or hoping our horoscope tells us what to do next? Are our children looking to us for how to live this believing Christian life or finding their role models or seeking everything except the word of God and the gospel? We need to take the advice of James in chapter 1, verse 22 in his book. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we need to strive more to be doers of the word and not just hearers. So we learn hearing is not necessarily believing. Secondly, when Jesus steps in, doubt is replaced by anticipation. When Jesus steps in, doubt is replaced by anticipation. anticipation. So, so Peter, verses three through six, so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cross lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cross lying there. So you know, I'm, I'm a track guy. Right? So the first time I read through this, I could, I could just see the foot race. And I actually wish I could be a witness to the disciple runathon. The disciple runoff. I wonder, I wonder what the ESPN coverage would have shown. And I thought of how when I ran the 400 meters, not as fast as my son runs it now, but that's another story. The 400 meters, which is one time around the track, when you turn that last curve, you see the finish line. Then a burst of adrenaline shoots through your body and an extra dose of energy is pumped in because you see the goal. You see the finish line. You see what you have been looking for. The younger John and older Peter heard that Jesus was not there the stone was rolled away and Jesus was not in it and the anticipation jumped through the roof and both of these men jolted to see, is it possible that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do? <laughs> John arrived first. He didn't go in. We don't really know if this is because he was trying to be respectful or if he was afraid to step into the tomb. What we do know is that Peter, even though he lost the race, he was the first to go in the tomb. Gerald Borchette in the American Commentary says this, John is thinking, body robbers leaving body wrappings? Do these ideas connect? They must have startled his mind into a computing mode that ended in believing. Before long, however, the slower running Peter arrived at the tomb following him. The reader will remember with a smile that when Peter finally recognized he needed to have his feet washed, he asked for a shower. But much more seriously, the reader will recall that after Peter professed a willingness to lay down his life for Jesus, he denied Jesus three times. That in the face of the arresting band, he sliced off the ear of Malchus, but then back down to a servant girl. And that at the sea, when he learned it was the Lord on the land, he hastily jumped off the boat and sprang into the water. As one searches the gospels, the examples continue to multiply. While the beloved disciple paused outside the tomb to view the scene, Simon Peter entered. 
The gospel accounts seem to focus on Peter mostly because it is probably, he's probably broken more than most. Because he had just betrayed Jesus. He just betrayed the Messiah. How, how could I go on? Every time he wakes up, he thinks about his mistake. Every time he would walk by the temple, he would think about Jesus. Every time he saw people gather around a fire, he would be reminded of the night that he betrayed Jesus. But seeing an empty tomb gave him hope. That his denial was not the end of his story. The empty tomb meant Peter had a chance to make up for the mistakes that he made. And understand this. The stone rolled in front of the grave did not keep Jesus in the tomb. That was not his purpose. (laughs) The tomb was open not to let Jesus' body out, but to let the disciples and the world see that he rose. So so when Mary saw that... it was removed. This was for her and the other disciples to see for themselves that Jesus had ridden. The doubt that they carried from the cruel scene at the cross was met with an empty grave. And now what was once doubt is now anticipation. He died. They buried him. And now all they see is his clothes. See, the grave clothes were lying on a stone shelf in the tomb without any evidence of violence or crime. But the grave clothes were empty. You see, the process of the spices and the linen used for burial created a casing. So what John saw was like a chrysalis of a butterfly, an empty shell. Jesus' grave clothes lay there like a cocoon, still retaining the shape of Jesus' body. Seeing this, it was evident that this was not a robbery. There is no way they could have taken his body without breaking the shell. The only possible answer was Jesus has written just as he said he would. Get the picture. They saw the crucifixion. They saw the nails. They, they saw the blood stream down from Jesus' body. In the back of their minds, they wished this wasn't so. But when they got to the tomb, the stone is rolled away. And we see from the other gospels, there is an angel who actually confirms what they saw. Their doubt was replaced by anticipation. Where is our Lord? What does he look like now? For Peter, I can only imagine what's going on in his head. What do I say first? Do I apologize for denying him? Do I tell him, you were right, I messed up, like husbands do to their wives? Do I see him and say nothing? Do I just run and bow at his feet? No matter what their thoughts were, they moved from doubt to anticipation. Their fears were replaced with faith. Their questions of the resurrection were met with an empty tomb. They are an example of how doubt in the presence of Jesus can move to anticipation of all the possibilities. What are you doubting today? What questions do you have? What is keeping you up at night and making you lose sleep? I want to tell you today, invite Jesus into your situation and watch your doubt move to anticipation. Watch your fears be transformed into faith. Look at your doubt and see an empty tomb. We've learned hearing is not necessarily believing. Secondly, we've learned when Jesus steps in, doubt is replaced by anticipation. Thirdly and finally, see and believe because the evidence is clear. John 20, 7 7 through 10, it says, And the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. The disciples are struggling to accept what they see. 
But what we have is the confirmation of the resurrection. The natural inclination is to doubt, but what they saw was true. Yet over the course of the years, there have been many who have tried to present arguments to discredit the risen Savior, to discredit the proof of the empty tomb. Here are a few. Jesus did not rise from the dead. His body was stolen from the tomb. The question is, who stole it? Neither the Jews nor the Romans wanted him, would have stolen it. As a matter of fact, if the Romans had the dead body of Jesus, it would have proven their point to drag Jesus' body through the streets and just get rid of this whole Christianity thing. Also, the disciples could not have stolen a body with the Roman guard at the door. And all accounts show that the disciples were scared, disheartened at the, cru the crucifixion. They would not have risked their lives for a lie. And when you look at the power in which the disciples carried on the message of the gospel from a group, group with everything against them, this wouldn't make sense for them to hide a body. Another objection is that Jesus only fainted and recovered from his wounds. He was crucified. Crucifixion is excruciating. It included asphyxia or suffocation, dehydration, heart failure. It would have been impossible for a beaten up Jesus to roll a stone out of the way and limp out of the tomb. And then to show him to the, himself to the disciples with his broken, beat up Jesus body, they would be more discouraged than encouraged. Another objection is the witnesses who saw him after he died were hallucinating. Question, could 500 plus people see a same humiliation at the same time? And he appeared several times to Peter, to Thomas, to the disciples, the woman at the tomb. None of those objections hold up. Why? Because Jesus did get up and he is alive. <laughs> Yeah. You can look to Hinduism, but they believe in reincarnation. So you come alive, but you keep dying. You can look to Buddhism, but last I checked, Buddha died and he still did. You can look to Islam, but last I checked, Muhammad died and he still did. You can look to Mormonism, but, but, but John Smith, he died and he still did. But when you look to Jesus, all the evidence presented, all the stories told, the only conclusion you have is to make is he did die, but he's not dead. He's alive. It looked like the game was over, but Jesus came through in the clutch. <laughs> it was September 30th, 2014. The, Roy the Royals were in a winner-take-all, one-game playoff with the Oakland A's to see if they could finally make it to the playoffs after 29 years, and, and everyone was watching, tuning into the game with anticipation. The first inning comes, and before you know it, the A's are up two to one. But it's only the first inning, so there's nothing really to worry about. Then the second inning passes and no change. Then the third inning comes, and the Royals get two runs. Now the game is three to two. And you hear this collective sigh of relief all over Kansas City. This, mark, this, this just really might be the year. The fourth and the fifth go by, and the Royals are still ahead, three to two. Then the sixth inning comes. And like a punch in the gut, the Oakland A's get five runs to take over the lead, seven to three. And you could hear the wails and the cries all over Kansas City as everybody turned their TV off. <laughs> because there's no coming back from that. So after the game, <laughs> I sent a text message to a Royals fan friend of mine. And I said, okay, I'm a believer now. He didn't respond, 
because he was one of those who turned his TV off after the sixth inning. So then, early the next morning, he sends me a text. It says, what happened? You see, when he turned his TV off, he didn't see that by the ninth inning, the Royals had tied the game up 7-7. Seven and seven. And in the twelfth inning, uh, inning, Salvador Perez hit a single that brought the game-winning run in, bringing the Royals to 9-8 and eight and the victory for the Royals. It looked like the game was over. It looked like there's no coming back. But when it looked like all was lost, the winning run came home. Mary thought the game was over. Peter thought the game was over. They had turned their faith off. There was no coming back. This is over. But when, the, when they witnessed the empty tomb, they have just experienced the greatest comeback ever. You don't have to feel like your game is over because God responds to the impossible. God restores the broken. He brings dead situations to life, not just life, but life more abundantly. So we learn that hearing is not necessary believing, and and Jesus steps in, doubt is replaced with anticipation. And finally, we learn we are taught to see and believe because the evidence is clear. I don't know where you are today in your belief or acceptance of Jesus in the cross. But I challenge you to take the journey to find him. Because if you seek him, he will find you. And the church said amen. 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 Father, we thank you for this word today. We thank you, Lord, that the tomb was empty. We thank you, Father, that when we thought all was lost, you came through in the clutch. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to live our lives knowing that we have the power of the resurrection in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming today. I want to invite you. Our prayer teams will be down here after service. Maybe something was said. Maybe something uh, was saying. Maybe you have questions. Our prayer team is more than happy to have you come down, be prayed for, or talk to you about Jesus, our Savior. Also, as you leave out today, there are books out in the foyer called The Case for Easter. If you have any questions, grab one, read it, and call me. (laughs) Between eight and five. I'm just joking. (laughs) Let us stand. Father, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you, Father, that when the stole was rolled away and Jesus walked out, those who came witnessed an empty tomb. And because of that empty tomb, we can live with the power of the resurrection. And let us live like that every day in the mighty name of Jesus. And all those who agree, said amen. Amen. amen.